was great. That was a budding geologist. That was very fascinating to myself. Uh, so we will move on now to our next amazing presenter. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. John Noe, a luminary in the fields of geology and paleontology. I think we'll actually have to also switch over the presentation. Um, in John's early career, he started out as a mining geologist in South Africa, and today he stands as a consulting geologist and paleontologist, bringing his wealth of experience to bear on projects of global significance. <clears throat> his dedication to fieldwork is matched only by his fervent commitment to education and outreach. Over the years, he has led numerous expeditions into the field, sharing his expertise and instilling a passion for geosciences in countless individuals. Beyond his professional pursuits, John is a man of many passions, seasoned marathon runner, enthusiastic skier, and let's not forget his culinary exploits evidenced by his love of spicy curries. <laughs> Today, Dr. John Node graces us with his expertise as he unveils the paleontology of the Springbank Offstream Reservoir Project, demonstrating the Alberta Heritage Act in action. Please join me in extending a warm welcome for Dr. John Noe. Can everyone hear me all right? Yep, good. Lovely. Okay, today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, fossils from pretty close to home. We're only about, uh, I guess, 15 kilometers away from the site where I've been working for the last two years. So um, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about the, the Heritage Act and uh, construction industry in our region is booming. And you can certainly tell that if you try and drive anywhere in Calgary, you're basically going to suffer some kind of traffic jams. And excavations are opening up some unprecedented new outcrops. And some of, the, some of those excavations include buildings, bridges, pipelines, uh, dams, and flood defenses. And flood defenses is what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, the Historical Resources Act was set up in Alberta in 1973. And the idea was to try and protect our natural resources and our heritage resources. So that includes archaeology, paleontology, and historical uh, structures as well. And so this requires research permits if you want to undertake any excavations where there's a chance of encountering historical resources. So if you are about to dig some kind of pipeline, for example, then you have to go through the whole process of uh, uh, analyzing the route that you're taking, de deciding whether or not there's a chance of finding significant uh, paleontological or archaeological discoveries, and then actually using uh, somebody to monitor the site, a, a scientific expert to monitor the site to make sure that nothing is damaged. So today we're just going to look at one example of that and just showing how the, the Heritage Act is actually being implemented. And I just want to thank Alberta Transportation and Economic Corridors for allowing the permission to present this material. They've been very, very helpful to us on site through the last two years. So let's start off with a little bit of background information about the Springbank site. Uh, basically, this is going to be a dry dam that's going to store floodwaters during any uh, dangerous dangers of floods. So uh, if you could think back to 2013, and I was one of the 100,000 people who were evacuated from their homes. It's quite interesting, actually, because I live in Inglewood, and at the other side of our road, all of the houses did not have to be ex uh, evacuated. All of their lights were on. We had no power everything was off for a week. So it's a, it, there was a very fine dividing line there. But anyway, as a result of these floods, which were probably at the time were the most expensive natural disaster that had happened in Canada's uh, history, they uh, implemented several different uh, techniques to try and avoid floods in the future. And one of them, and this one really only affects people who live in the, the expensive houses down by Mission in that area, but nonetheless, they, uh, they set up this dry dam to take off a lot of the flow from the Elbow River during floods. And the cost of this project is about $750 million. And uh, the excavations have been in progress since uh, early 1922, although, uh, 2022, although it does 
go back. The, the, the exploratory work in advance of the project goes back to 2014. Uh, this is what the project looks like. So I'm just using a pointer for those of you who are online. We're, we're basically going to make our way up from the river, uh, from number one here. The idea is that there's going to be a, a, a set of dam gates that will open during floods and the water will be allowed to flow through a three and a half kilometer long uh, canal that's being uh, excavated and up into a large dry dam that occurs at the top of this map. And uh, what we are going to do today is that we're going to make our way through the same route that the floodwaters are going to take, starting off by the river and making our way up towards the north. <clears throat> so a little geological overview of this area. So we, we basically got uh, three main formations sitting in here. We've got the Brazo formation down to the uh, southwest, and then that's overlain by the coal spur. And the coal spur spans the KT boundary. So if we look at the uh, stratigraphic column on the lower left here, you can see that we've got the Brazo, the coal spur, and then that's overlain by the Pascapoo. And the Pascapoo is the, the, the bedrock that we often see outcropping around Calgary and uh, has been worked on and presented on at the, this conference and other events in the, and, and, uh, over the last few years. And that the Pascapoo is uh, Paleocene in age. And all of these rocks that we're going to be looking at today were deposited in dominantly terrestrial settings, except possibly for a little slice of the Alberta group. And I'm going to talk about that in, in a few minutes. So if we look at the depositional character, and this pretty much applies to the whole site, what we've got is that we've got interbeds of sandstone, siltstone, mudstone, and coals. And the sandstone beds are typically trough crust bedded with wavy laminae and ripples and these lateral accretion surfaces that you can see on the top right here in that dipping down here. And this is really classic uh, meandering channel deposits. And then we also have siltstones, which are finer grained. And so were deposited in lower energy conditions, which we think were possibly backwaters within these uh, fluvial environments. And then we've got the mudstones, which were generally deposited on the banks of these rivers. So you'd have occasional flooding events, which would push out the, the mudstones away from the rivers. So very much what we see, like what we see in Calgary today. And then there were numerous coals, although the coals are generally not that thick, but uh, these would probably represent peat swamps. And then occasional bentonites as well. These bentonites are ash beds, and they would have been sourced from proto-volcanoes from when the Rockies were forming. So as the Rockies were beginning to build up at this time, there were small volcanoes which were issuing ash, which was blowing out across the landscape. And these ashes are very useful because they can be used for dating. So the overall interpretation for this depositional settings is a nice terrestrial environment on a gently dipping temperate floodplain. And this would be dipping down towards the Western Epicontinental Seaway. So there was a large seaway running all the way from the Yukon, at least all the way down into places like Columbia. And that we are on the, on the Western bounds of this seaway. Now I'm saying that this is terrestrial, but I am gonna show you that there's two possible little uh, exceptions to this rule, to, this, uh, to the uh, general sandstones and mudstones. And we're gonna be looking at those as we go through the presentation. Oh, sorry. Wrong way. So there's lots of structural features here. We are sitting, the environment is uh, the triangle zone at the, in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. So we have the Rocky Mountains lying to the west of us. And we are in the foothills, so we are still seeing a lot of uh, uh, contortion and tectonic stresses. And what we're seeing in here is a very steeply dipping folded wedge of sediment uh, with a Brazo thrust fault running through the middle. So I was quite excited as the, as the excavation has gone on through the site to see what the Brazo thrust actually looks like, because this is a, a thrust that has, has not been uh, seen in this area before. It's only due to the excavation so we can see it. And what you actually see is that you have um, lots of very tightly folded sediments. And you can see this section at the bottom here, which is about uh, 30 meters long, is that the sandstones are pretty, they're strong and, they're, and they tend not to suffer a lot of tectonic stress. But the mudstone beds that are in between these sandstones are often very tightly folded. We actually see that some of the sediments on site are vertically dipping, although the dip flattens out as you move towards Calgary. So as you go towards the, the, north, the northeast, we'll see that the dips go from 85 to 90 degrees down to about 20 degrees dipping down towards the southwest. And I just wanted to show this one picture. This is not a paleontological picture. This is just uh, using drone images that were collected by our parent company that was doing the, uh, the construction work. And you can see that this is a 160 meter long section 
that has been exposed for to develop to build one of the, the big berms that's going to uh, control the, the, the passage of the floodwaters. And so we've got this section that's been cut through here, horizontal section that we're looking down on from above. And what we did was that before they went in with the drone, we uh, mapped out all of the fractures. So we basically took red paint and I had a team of volunteers helping me and we painted in all of the fractures that you can see here from uh, a, a, a worm's eye view here and then from the, the, the um, drone view here as well. And it's a unique opportunity for us to see this pavement of fractures. And so uh, there's a, I've done a lot of work on this, the, the structural aspects of this, which I'm not gonna be sharing today, but will, will be published as well. And one of the nice things about this is that to make sure that the, all of the cement that they use sticks to this, they come along basically with a giant vacuum cleaner, a hydrovac. So this is like a geologist's dream. Not only do they cut off a huge exposure for me, they then went along with a hoover and cleaned it all up as well. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is look at some of the, uh, the parts of the site here and what we saw when they were doing the excavations. And these images are all taken from uh, the Government of Alberta videos, which are available to view on YouTube. So if you're interested to find out a bit more about this project, they are really quite nicely done, these videos. They're only about three or four minutes long, so it's not like you have to spend your whole day looking at them. And this is just showing what the diversion inlet is going to look like. So this is uh, in the middle of the structure there. We can see these are the kind of lock gates. So when we get into flood on the Elbow River, they'll open these gates up and the water will start flowing along this the canal that's being created. So some of the deposits that we saw in this diversion inlet, which is the most steeply dipping beds that we see on site, uh, one, of the, one of these beds is a beautiful flood deposit. And uh, I was reminded of this when I, after the 2013 flood, I went to Canyon Creek area, and there's these giant log jams that, were, that have been created along Canyon Creek. And this is basically one of those log jams that from back in the Cretaceous. And what we can see here is that there's big pieces of wood up to a meter in length, and they're all charcoal ice, so they've been slightly diagenetically altered. And then within this wood, there's lots of pieces of amber as well. And the amber is pretty small, unfortunately. It's a sort of half a centimeter across. So I'm still hopeful that we might be able to pull a couple of insects out of here, but those insects are going to have to be pretty tiny to be preserved. And the other exciting thing that we saw in this, this bed is that you see uh, so, some bones. And, that, and this is a, a, an example of a dinosaur bone here, um, probably, possibly a piece of rib that uh, was incorporated into this flood deposit. And I have to say that I also came to the site with high expectations of finding a lot of dinosaur material, and it just isn't here. And I think the reason for that is not because the dinosaurs weren't living in this area, but because for the most part, the groundwaters that have flowed through here have actually led to the dissolution of these bones. So we're not seeing many bones on site. So it may be that the, the, the fossil wood here created some kind of buffer that led to the be better chance of preservation of the bone. These are some structures that uh, were also, we, we view, were able to view these from above, from the drone data, but also from on, on foot as well. And these were a set of side right nodules which extended across the site in one area of the diversion inlet. So I've it highlighted them in red on that, that upper right hand diagram there. Each of these side right nodules is about this size, and uh, they're very similar size, all of them, and they are nicely spaced out as well. And I'm not saying that these are definitely dinosaur footprints, but one of the interpretations of these is that they were a set of dinosaur footprints. And the dinosaur footprints were made, so you had these depressions in the ground, and then plant material was washed into them, maybe during uh, rainstorms. And then that plant material has, uh, formed a nucleus for siderite cementation or iron carbonate cementation. And I do have some precedent for this, because if you go to Dinosaur Provincial Park, which is one of our fantastic resources here in Alberta, on the lower left there, I've arrowed very similar siderite cemented concretions, which are on the bank of a, a river deposit, which we also think are dinosaur footprints. So this is a, a tentative footprint site rather than being an absolute guarantee. But uh, what we find with these trace fossils and when you're seeing at traces that animals have left behind is that it's great when the traces look fantastic. So if you leave a footprint in a, a beach, it looks wonderful. But what you often see is that though your footprint says you're dragging your heels, there's lots of mud on your shoe, and things don't always look quite as clear cut. So you need to have an open mind when you're looking at trace fossils. And then this is uh, one of those weird things that we see. So across the whole site, as I said, it's all sandstones and mudstones, all terrestrial. And then we have this one little bed of oysters. And Paul Johnson, who's, who's here in the audience, has kindly come out to the site and had a look at these as well. 
And we have this very well-defined two meter thick oyster bed sitting in the middle of all these terrestrial sediments. So there's two explanations for this. One is that we've got a small thrust slice of the underlying Alberta formation. And the other one is that we've got uh, some kind of marine incursion here. So we've had a rise in relative sea level, similar to what we're seeing now with uh, associated with climate change. And that, that's led to the, an oyster bed being able to form at the boundary of some inland sea. So uh, when, you, when you look at these deposits, you also see there was one ammonite in here. So this is the only ammonite that I found on the site, which is in the, on the lower right here. It's totally recrystallized, so it's very hard to see exactly what kind of animal it is. We know it's a baculites, but we're finding the species is, is probably going too far. But this, so all of this evidence is pointing to these being marine deposits. And I should also mention that we've got a lot of core data that was drilled here, geotechnical cores. So there's a core on the left-hand side here. And this was looked at by engineers, not by geologists in the early days. And the engineers confidently said that they thought this was a fault zone. But if you looking at this with new eyes and knowing that these oysters are here, we can see that there's a beautiful cord section through this oyster bed as well. So anyway, we're hoping to do more work. We've looked at a bunch of other oyster beds across the province to try and uh, formulate some ideas about where, trying to find out more about whether this was a marine incursion in, in the Brazo formation or whether it belongs to the underlying Alberta formation. So now let's move to the diversion channel, the emergency spillway. So we're making our way through the site and we're kind of within that um, canal area where the canal will be carrying this flood waters towards the northeast. And what we see here is a lot of um, plants. We're gonna be talking a lot about plants for the rest of the presentation. And there was this beautiful fossil tree exposed over the course of a few days. And uh, I was able to get up close and personal with this tree and take some pictures of it and uh, do some analysis on the tree as well. And what you can see when you look at the tree here is this is what the tree looks like. So it's a, about a meter in length, something like that. But the nice thing is it's in life position. So the bedding here is pretty flat sitting in here, maybe about 20 degrees, but our tree is actually sitting there, uh, sitting relatively sub-vertical. And so we've got this tree in live position and it's, it's actually rooted into a mudstone bed. So it's, it was actually growing in a mudstone and then it's surrounded by sandstone. So it's some kind of river channel has come through and somehow the tree has managed to stand up to this river channel and uh, survive in life position and, and it was able to be fossilized. When you look at the actual trunk of the tree, this is a view looking down on the trunk We've got a, a cemented middle to the tree and the, the, um, the outer bark, the outer layer is still preserved as a charcoalized rim. And we, what we see this a lot with these fossil trees as well is that a lot of them are charcoalized. This is another rooted tree that was right next to our, our friend here who's standing up vertically. And this rooted tree is just preserved as a stump. And you can see that the, the, almost the entire structure has been charcoalized there. So this wasn't the only tree that we found in this part of the succession. This is another big stump of a, a tree, possibly um, a dawn redwood. We'll talk about dawn redwoods more in a minute. And you can see that this stump here is about 60 centimeters across. It's also sitting in life position, so not just a fallen, fallen piece, although there were several logs as well. But this is in life position. And the nice thing is that when we look down on this, you can see all of these little black tendrils here. And these are all the roots of the tree that were spreading out laterally. And some of these roots extended up to a meter and a half away from the body of the tree itself. And as you can see, the, the, the trunk of the tree is about 60 centimeters. And you would be expecting to see that these trees would have beautiful rings, just like we'd imagine in a modern tree. But it doesn't seem to be like that. When you look at the internal structure of the tree, you have a much more, almost like a spiral pattern that's coming out from the center of the tree. And I just put this one in as well to show that this is very typical, what I call shrubs, you know, the, 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 the actual, diameter of some of the smaller trees here, this is another tree, is mainly only about 20, 10 centimeters, 15 centimeters. So there are actual little groves of these trees that you find together. So on one bedding plane, you might find five or six of these small shrubs. One of the other nice things in this part of the succession was that there was actually a microvertebrate site. And this is, microvertebrate sites are hugely important to paleontologists because it's all very well finding a big skeleton of an animal. But in microvertebrate sites, a lot of small material gets washed together, claws, teeth, scales. And those small elements can represent hundreds of species rather than just one or two species if you find big animals. So we haven't had a, a lot of luck with finding microvertebrate sites that include vertebrate material. We've got quite a few shell beds and things like that that I'll talk about in a moment. But this is one site where we actually managed to pull out some vertebrates. So um, if I, this is what the succession looks like. So it's about uh, four meters of mudstones with lots of shell beds within them. 
And this is just an example of some of those shell beds are often gastropod dominated. But then we've also got some uh, additional vertebrate fossils in there. And uh, they include crocodile teeth, uh, champsosaur vertebrae, which is a crocodile-like animal that grew up to about four feet long. We've got one or two little dinosaur bones sitting in here. No dinosaur teeth yet. That's my hope is that this spring, once we have the melt, that we're going to get some uh, dinosaur teeth out of here. Turtle shell and then some garfish scales as well. And we've got a couple of small lizard scales. So that there's, there are vertebrate animals in there. And uh, the, the depositional environment we, we're suggesting here is probably something like a lake, lake shore. And we've got uh, lots of snails, uh, invertebrates just living along this lake shore. And then we've got these animals coming down to browse on this material. So let's move to the diversion outlet now. So it's continuing to move our way northeast across the site. And uh, this is what the canal would look like when, when it's finished. Uh, hopefully it won't look like that all the time because that's full of flood water. So hopefully it'll be empty most of the time. And in here, this is some examples of these shell beds. We see these shell beds across the site. They can be really well defined. And this is a, a, a gastropod shell bed. Uh, the gastropod is called Fl Pleurocera, but you can see I, in, in half an hour, I was able to collect 200 specimens of the, the, the gastropods, and that was only collecting the whole one. So there are lots of others there as well. But the nice thing is that some of these shell beds also include uh, vertebrate material as well. So we're getting garfish scales, um, some pieces of amid uh, fish uh, skeleton and skull fragments as well, and also more crocodile teeth. Although I have to say the crocodile teeth are pretty dwarfish here. It, it, I, it suggests to me that probably the, um, the environment wasn't uh, quite as nice as it was in some of the other areas, like in Dinosaur Provincial Park, because we, don't, we haven't found any teeth that were bigger than maybe a, a centimetre in length. We also have unionid lags and uh, unionid shells. These are freshwater bivalves. They, they don't like the river conditions to be too fast flowing. And if you are interested in these animals, you can still find them in the Bow River and the South Saskatchewan River today. So uh, you can find modern ones. You can actually go out and look for these in the field and then find the modern shells along the riverbanks as well. And uh, there are also crayfish in there as well. And you find crayfish burrows in these deposits that sort of match them. So if we look at these pictures here, on the lower left there, you can actually see a modern unionid. This picture is actually taken from Ferry Crossing in Eastern Alberta, but they, they are mobile, these animals, they move around. But as I said, they don't like the current to be too strong. They're, so that's generally an indicator that you've probably got a more languid meandering river rather than a fast flowing braided river. And these deposits here, they, they tend to occur at the base of the rivers. So they're probably lag deposits where they're washed together. But you, as you can see, these are relatively complete, so they, although I don't think that they're all in life position. Well, we did find one um, domicnia or a, a domicile, a dwelling of one of these animals. And there's whole beds of these when you go out to um, Cochrane and look along by the river there in the Pascapoo formation. But th this one is uh, from slightly older from the Brazo formation. And this is, it looks like an inverted crater or something like that. So what was happening was that the, the Unionid would fire water out to make a little kind of crater shape for itself to embed itself in, in the riverbed. One of the best sites and one of the ones that's been of most interest to the Tour Museum is uh, uh, the, what I call the delicate leaf beds. And I called it that because they are delicately preserved. They're beautifully preserved, these leaves. And we've got a set of the, the beds here that's about four meters in thickness that you can see on the, the upper right here. And so we've collected uh, around 20, 25 different species of leaves from this site. And uh, uh, the specialist from the Tyrrell Museum, Christopher, Dr. Christopher West, has come out to site to have a look at these. And uh, we, we're feeding him these leaves, not literally, but we're passing these leaves to him over time for him to uh, analyze and to uh, build up a picture of what's going on with the, uh, the environment back in the, the late Cretaceous and early tertiary. So these are just some, and they're mainly uh, sycamore leaves here, but uh, we, you also find hazels. The, 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 there is a video that uh, the Tyrrell posted from a very nice talk last week, which uh, included uh, material from Northern Calgary, which looks at a lot of similar species to these. So that's a good reference to, if you want to have a look at them in more detail. Uh, there are also lots of uh, Dawn Redwoods, Metasequoia. So this is uh, the, the fronds of this, uh, this tree that it also produces cones. We've got a couple of cones out as well. And this is what the tree looks like today. A lot of these trees are extant in places like southern China, in the more temperate zones of China. So that also gives us a nice idea of what's going on with the environment here and the, and the climate at that time. Uh, down the bottom here, we've got these uh, nice fossil seeds from a, a tree called uh, Katsura type tree. And this is what the modern Katsura looks like, which is another southern Chinese specimen. 
and lots and lots and lots of fossil wood. And I just put in one picture here, but there are hundreds of pieces of fossil wood. You get to the stage where you've just stopped looking at it in detail. Although it is worth looking at fossil wood and, and these leaves as well to look for evidence of uh, insect damage, and uh, that, which is a really nice kind of trace fossil. So now I'm going to talk about one of the, to me, one of the most exciting discoveries uh, at Springbank, and this is uh, oncoids. So this is uh, some modern examples of algal balls that are growing just offshore Australia. The picture's by a friend of mine, Heidi Allen, but uh, keep this picture in mind as we go through the next few slides. So oncoids and their freshwater cousins are layered structures, and they're basically formed by algae. They're a little bit like stromatolites, for anybody who knows what stromatolites are like, but they tend to grow just as a basically algal balls, and uh, that's a term that my boss enjoys, so I will stick with that. Uh, typically, they, 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 they have to be more than two millimeters in diameter to be described as oncoids or algal balls, but they can grow up to about eight centimeters in size, and they often form around a nucleus, and in marine conditions, these balls are getting flipped every now and again, so they'll be sitting in a shallow marine environment, there'll be waves coming through, and then every now and again, there'll be a bit of a storm, and they get flipped over, the algae will grow on the top, then they get flipped over again, the algae grow on the, the top, and you end up with a ball-like structure, an irregular ball-like structure. However, I didn't even know this, but they also can occur in freshwater conditions, but it's pretty rare. And what you, uh, there's a nice example I've got here from Bavaria, so it'd be great, you can go there if you wanted to study these, drink beer in the evenings, and then go out and look at algal balls in the daytime. And these are modern ones, and they grow in a couple of rivers there, but mainly in the upper Alps River in Bavaria. And they require certain characteristics, so low flow velocities, they need that, that sort, of, sort of some warmish conditions as well. And ideally they need quite odd geochemistry. So where these form, you also see them in Chile and the, on the edge of the Titicama, uh, not on the Atacama Desert. Uh, so they, they like odd geochemistry. And I think this is uh, related to sort of the algal bloom philosophy. So what happens is that if you have this odd geochemistry, it stops the fish being so ready to kind of swim along and eat the algae. So the algae get a chance to build up. So this is an example of a freshwater oncoid from the recent. So this is a recent specimen. And you can see that despite the fact these aren't being rolled, so they're not being rolled around in the river, there's evidence they grow in situ and stay in situ, but they're still forming these ball-like structures. They just have thinner layers on the bottom and bit thicker layers on the top. So this is what modern freshwater oncoids look like. We also see them in the fossil record. And uh, this example here is, uh, it's, it was a real trigger for me. So this is from Tremp, the Tremp Basin, which is a, a really uh, a famous place for geologists to go and visit and learn about geology. And this is, sits at the, the boundary between the Cretaceous and the, the tertiary here. So this is the KT boundary. This is the dinosaur extinction event. Dinosaurs down here, no dinosaurs up here, very sadly. So that, that example there kind of triggered to me, uh, that I wonder whether this has something to do with what's happening in, in my deposit, where I have 450, 500 meters of sands and mudstones, and then one layer of oncoids between them. So let's go on and have a look at what I found at Springbank. So these are my oncoids from Springbank, and I have one bed this thick sitting in 500 meters of sands and muds that is full of oncoids. And the oncoids are not just little oncoids, they're oncoids up to 20 centimeters across. Some of the biggest oncoids that have been reported from anywhere in the world, certainly the biggest freshwater oncoids that have ever been seen. So very exciting. Uh, this is some arrows to show that's a, a, a meter rule for scale there, just to give you an idea of the size of these. Uh, they're nicely concentrically layered, just like the, the ones that we talked about earlier. And they're also associated with these big leaves, big sycamore leaves. And uh, there's also unione bivalves in there and gastropods. So we're at this, we're from the same um, geological period that we've the other rocks that we've looked at. Unfortunately, we didn't see them in situ, so we only saw them just after they'd been mined out. They moved them over and they put them in a big pile. And I went over to look at the pile and found this. That's weird. What's this doing here? This 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 shouldn't be here because these should only occur in limestones. They should only occur in marine conditions, and yet we have this bed of oncoids on site. So when you look at them in detail, we sliced this one open and had it polished, and you can see the beautiful layering in here. When you zoom in on these, you can see the individual little tiny colonies that are growing up within these oncoids. Uh, this is what the thin sections look like. So there's oncoids of all size in here. They, they range up from this two millimeters up to the about 25 centimeters in length. So what is this bed doing here? Well, we know the coal spur formation, which this occurs in, straddles the KT boundary, the tertiary, uh, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. We know that at that point, there was a huge meteor impact down in the, 
the Chicxulub crater was formed down in the Gulf of Mexico. So my theory is that this oncoid bed represents the KT boundary. So we've got uh, a, a smoking gun sitting right here. And the way to test that is to look for iridium. So iridium is a, a, a classic indicator of the KT boundary. You go from a background one part per billion up to about 3000 parts per billion. So what we've done is that we've sampled these oncoids and the oncoid beds, plus some control samples from just away from the beds. And we've sent those off to uh, Ontario and they're busy being analyzed right now. They're going to a nuclear reactor for a month and then they pull them out and then they measure the radio radioactivity that they emit for another month. And from that, they can get an idea of what the concentration of iridium is. So watch this space. Hopefully yeah. within the next six weeks, I'll be able to tell you either I'm completely wrong or there's something very exciting out of Springbank. Something else that's exciting out of Springbank we can't talk about right now. I, I can talk about a little bit. So we found a very interesting type of fossil plant, which is busy being prepared at the, at the museum right now. And uh, hopefully will go on display within the next year or so. And it was a very uh, exciting, uh, time where the, the bunch of guys came out from the tour museum with rock saws. We got that specimen taken out on this giant excavator, which was actually the specimen was too heavy for the flatbed. So they ended up having to cut it down. But this specimen is now at the museum. The plant is at over a meter in size and something completely new to science. It's not just a new species, it's a new genus, possibly a new family. So uh, we're, we're just waiting to see what happens. Uh, Professor West is uh, busy working on it right now. So I'm just going to finish off with one extra little site. We, one of the other things that we've been looking for is quaternary fossils. So we were looking for hopefully mammal fossils and uh, we, we have not come across any quaternary mammal fossils with, with, apart from sub-recent uh, discoveries. So this is a, a bison graveyard where we found the remains of several bison. And we can tell this because we kept finding lower left-hand jaws for some reason, but uh, that was able to tell us that we had quite a few specimens here. But uh, the specimens are actually at the border here between the soil and the underlying gravel. So we actually don't think that they're fossil, they're just sub-recent. But uh, just to show you that we are looking out for these mammal fossils as well. So I'm going to conclude, first of all, by showing you this picture, which, funnily enough, I actually uh, originally drafted this to look, look at Livingston and uh, that some of the work that's been done up in the north of Calgary in the Pascaboo, but it's equally applicable to the sediments that we've been looking at today. So we've got rivers running through here, these meandering rivers with fish in them, crocodiles on the banks. And then uh, away from the banks, we've got these groves of sycamores, hazel trees, and uh, we've got uh, maybe even some algal oncoids growing somewhere in our river here as well. So just to summarize, we've only really scraped the surface, or literally scraped the surface here at uh, Springbank, but you can see from this that these industrial projects provide a unique set of data. So every, every site that you go to is a chance that you otherwise wouldn't get. And if you don't go and monitor these sites and don't follow the, the guidelines of the Heritage Act, then all of this data will be lost forever and all of these fossils will be destroyed. So I think that Alberta has demonstrated that, that how this legislation can really preserve these sites. And, and I really just want to kind of give a nudge here to some of the other countries around the world, that they should they be following suit? Most countries do not have any legislation protecting fossil discoveries, so I think it's probably time that they reconsidered what they were doing. Thank you very much. So I'm happy to take questions. All of these animals that have been seen on site during the last, I've seen all of these on site during the last couple of years as well. The bear is actually, we were on that outcrop. I mean, everyone's seen lots of bears, but we literally walked back to the truck, got in the truck, and then the bear just waited until we were gone before he came down. I think he's looking at some fossil shell beds there. That, that they, they were in that area. Yes, Darren. Yeah. Uh, the, the land is now government owned. It wasn't originally, but it's now government owned. What they've done with the, the spillways is that where, where the, the ingress point is, that's all cemented and the, the whole, it's absolutely amazing structure where the water's gonna come into the site. The actual spillway itself is coated by riprap uh, up to the top of the bedrock exposure. And after that, it's just soil to the top. So there won't really be any exposure left at all. And the riprap's going in right now. So you can literally look across at this, plain that's just covered with limestone boulders that they're bringing in from Exxon. 
So yeah, so I don't think there's going to be a lot of exposure left there for collectors to go and visit. Yes. John, I hope your theory about the uh, long plate is correct. There's tons of iridium, and, and uh, that would be exciting. Let's talk now about process. What what does that represent? Uh, you know, how is it that we get those forming at that time, given you know the sort of bleak scenario? Yeah, yeah. That, uh, rolled across North America, coming up from Yucatan after the impact. Well, we, first of all, the fact that we see that same oncoid bed in Spain, which is a long way away, is, you know, that's a nice analog, but it's not the answer because we certainly don't see this, this um, oncoid bed everywhere in Alberta where the, the KT boundary is exposed. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I just imagine, like you're saying, this sort of nuclear winter where after the blast, wildfires, massive amount of ash going into the rivers, just a, a very different uh, geochem geochemical environment. And maybe it, it was just the, the environment that the algae needed. Maybe they, they were the only things that could really grow. I mean, we, we're totally shocked to see this bed. Everything is just really predictable there. You know, there's nice sands, there's nice muds and occasional siltstone beds. And then suddenly you've got this bed, not just with oncoids in it, but whacking great oncoids as well. So it, there's gotta be some reason. So this is just the theory. Yeah. And certainly it's nice for us that we have, not only do we have the chance to test for iridium, but when we, we, we asked a company in uh, America how much it would cost, and they said it was eight and a half thousand dollars a sample. Wow. And so um, I talked to the U of A and they said, well, we can do the analysis for you, but our resolution is only five parts per million. So that's actually beyond the resolution that we need. But they said, why don't you contact this Action Labs in Ontario? And they were 30 bucks a sample. So. <laughs> <laughs> A yeah, <laughs> I'm, cr I'm crowd. I'm crowdsourcing for funding. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Patty. Did you get a chance to look at the answers at Sparingy? Yes. Because uh, I had the same type of algal line as what I call the rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's funny because you seem to have this sort of uh, spectrum where you go from the algal balls to stromatolites to what you've got which to me is almost halfway to a tufa but clearly has some algal components to it as well so i mean i, I just i'm sure there's people out there who are doing more work on this I'm, I'm not an expert on them i'm just there's lots of papers out there about oncoids but they're almost all marine so it's very exciting to find fresh water so yeah i'd, I'd love to visit your lake one day <laughs> yes areas post the, the meteor. Yes. And that if you're looking for those, you'd be looking along the line of where the the cast offs from the impact cast off would be. Yes. And so then you'd be able to find a, a more definitive line of the impact cast off and what yeah, normally that normally that that uh, that contact layer is at less ten centimeters or less in thickness. And the ones most of the ones that we have here in Alberta, funny enough, Taco's done quite a bit of work on this as well and visited a lot of these sites. But typically, you've got a kind of ash bed in there, and then you go back into sort of a terrestrial deposition afterwards. So you have a thin ash bed. So yes, we do have something different here. So I, I don't know exactly why that is. Maybe a slightly different geochemical regime, or maybe the, the river just had a, like a little enclave where the algae were able to grow, which they weren't in other areas. So I, I don't know quite why it is, but I didn't mention, but there's another example in Poland. And then when you look at some of the other contacts around the world, the other, other extinction events, so like the Fermenian Franian event, that there's oncoids on that contact as well. So this is not a one-off and it's not just the KT boundary. There's other boundaries as well. And that information was actually given to me by, I was having a, I was at a pega dinner, which I wouldn't recommend ever going to those unless you have to. But the, a guy on my table said, what are you working on? And I was all excited because I just found these oncoids. And he said, oh, we see them in core. He said, we, when we drill down, we look for them to find this boundary. So they're actually using them as a, a guide to, to, to locating these boundaries between different uh, formations. I, I'll just let Taco on, ask the question first. At least as far as you don't find the oncoids. Yeah, 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 I know. Yes. With bison um, bone bed, yeah. 
Have you, um, is there anybody interested in looking at whether they're bison bison or kind of older? Yes, yeah, yeah. So, so the I think there's bison and antiquus. I'm looking at I'm looking at Lisa here to make sure that I get this right. So there, there was a bigger version of our modern bison yeah. sitting back down. And so we we have people within my department at Stantec who are way more expert than me on identifying these fossil mammals and even sub recent mammals. So the, the interesting thing about this deposit is that it when you looked at the bones, they didn't have any cut marks on them, so they weren't archaeological and they weren't old enough to be fossils. I mean, we generally have a kind of like a, a five, 10,000 year line, but um, and these were definitely significantly younger than that. So they didn't really fall into the, the, the remit of either the paleontologists or the archeologists. So they were a kind of, it was nice that we found them, but uh, you know, we, we talked to First Nations about this as well. And that we, there was, a, I believe there was a ceremony to celebrate these animals, but we did not collect any of that material. Met him first here at our symposium, uh, a doctor that does that, Dr. Mike Wilson. Oh, yeah. And so, and he is really interested in finding uh, like bison and tickets, like okay. they came from and about when. So, well, I didn't mention it, but the, the, the picture that I showed of the bison bones. The um the horn when I when I showed the pictures of the horn core to my colleague she said the, the our bison specialist she said that's a two year old female, <laughs> which is pretty amazing. So yeah, that's so that we we do have people in our department who are pretty good at this as well. But yeah, I'm sure Dr. Wilson could uh, tell tell you a lot more about these bison bones than I could. Yeah, probably not see them. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, if you have any questions afterwards, feel. Please uh, come and find me in the break. I'm going to be here all day. Quick one. Yes. Yeah, they're, they're actually in a barn on site, and I've logged a bunch of them already from a geological point of view rather than a geotechnical point of view. I mean, they, they have a term called clay shale, the geotechnical engineers, which is kind of like anything that's finer grain than a sand, pretty much, it seems to me. Because they're looking at them in terms of how they can use them for fill, how, the, how they can be excavated safely. So they have a different uh, approach to what we would use. So yeah, all of those cores are stored. And I, to me, they're a valuable resource. I actually presented them at a core conference last year on four of the cores, just to show that we have this industrial resource, as well as the oil and gas. We also have construction cores that are available for study. Right on. Well, thank you again, John, very much, thank you very much. for the excellent presentation. Thanks. And you also have <laughs>